welcome to a, a special edition of uh, the 11th OVC. For those of you who've been watching us and following us uh, for a while now, you know that uh, here behind me, Fort Casper Museum is, is our home. Uh, this is kind of where we, uh, most of us live in this area. Uh, we do most of our planning, our videos uh, in this area. Uh, and our home fort, our home you know, museum is Fort Casper Museum. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is because uh, today we have a special treat for you guys. Uh, we're going to be actually interviewing uh, Joanna Wickman, uh, who you probably have seen before in some of our other videos, that uh, has done so much research and so much help uh, for a special edition or a special exhibit that is going on in the fort here. Uh, it's actually been going on for almost a year now. It has about one month left or a few weeks left uh, for this exhibit before they take it down. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of do one last hurrah and, and interview her and show you guys just the amazing artifacts uh, and the tie to the uh, Civil War and the Trans-Mississippi history from the 1860s. So without further ado, let's go inside. All right, Joanna, so uh, we are here in the 11th Kansas exhibit here at Fort Casper Museum. So we're going to do a walkthrough of the artifacts and the kind of the different aspects that the museum has here. Uh, this has been kind of a, a long journey to get to this point, right? Yeah, so yeah. So what, uh, if you were going to kind of start with, where did the idea or the genesis come from, from this uh, the idea of, of having this exhibit and uh, what was the, the, I guess, the efforts put into it? So this project really came out of the research I was doing for my book on Preston Plum, The Forgotten Senator. Right. And in doing the research for that book, I had to work with a lot of museums in Kansas. I worked with private collectors. And through that, I just made contacts with folks at these different places. And I became aware of things they had in their private collections, things that the museums had in their collections. And so in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, you know, wow, all of these things <laughs> <a lot>. together. <laughs> would make a really neat exhibit and so it was kind of in the back of my mind and then uh, I talked to museum staff here and, and they were supportive of doing an exhibit on the 11th Kansas. Uh, the Fort Casper Museum has never done one on the 11th <laughs> right. Kansas before. Well, so it, this kind was of interesting. Unique. I'll kind of interrupt you there. The, the, the regiment that kind of takes the precedence uh, here is the 11th Ohio, which is kind of interesting because the, the, the day, the, I guess the famous day of the battle, you had like one, two, three dudes here from the 11th Ohio. Everyone here was from the 11th Kansas, basically. Right, uh, right. So it's, it's kind of interesting that the 11th Ohio gets, uh, the, you know, gets all the credit and the 11th Kansas is actually the guys who went out and fought and, and ultimately died. So Yeah, you know, especially, yeah, the Battle of Red Buttes, Battle of Platte Bridge, and then other skirmishes here. Exactly. So they were, even though they were here for a short time, only six months, they were very involved in fighting here, um, there were a number of casualties. Yeah, it's just kind of over time their stories sort of slipped through the cracks in favor of Casper Collins in the 11th Ohio. And you know, we certainly don't want to diminish that. No, definitely. But not. by doing this exhibit, we're able to kind of bring recognition to another regiment that was here. That yeah. yeah, kind of fell through the cracks. For sure. So there's a lot here, a lot we have to get through. <laughs> what? So how did we get? All, I mean, we have photos from 11th Kansas, we have artifacts, we have a painting uh, with Preston <laughs> Plum, we have books. I mean, so how did we get all of the stuff that is in this exhibit? Uh, so that's actually pretty amazing. So some of the things, like we have uh, Colonel Plum's saddle and saddlebags so, and, and the painting. So my favorite exhibit. Uh, exactly. Those came from the Lyon County History Center in Emporia. And of course, Emporia, Kansas is the town that he founded in 1857 right. um, and some of the photographs uh, behind me came from private collectors as well as some of the photographs of Colonel Plum. Uh, the program to the senator that's behind me came from me um, <laughs> in my house. Uh, some of the firearms came from other private collectors and the guide on and the arrows from the Battle of Platte Bridge that have not been here since 1865 right. came from the State Museum in Topeka, Kansas. And oh, wow. so all of the things in this exhibit are all on loan aside from one photograph, which is that portrait of Private Bonwell there, 
That is actually in the museum's collection. Everything else you see on exhibit is on loan, which is why this is such a unique exhibit and frankly probably unlikely to ever happen again just yeah. because of all of the loans involved to bring all these things together in one spot. Exactly. So we're going to go through these uh, and uh, we'll have you kind of tell us this, the story of, of how you acquired it and what it is uh, here right now. All right, sounds good. All right, so we're going to start here, and uh, what you said is actually probably one of the more important things, although it's not an artifact, but it is actually a, a few panels, or not just a few, but a, a, you know, a lot of panels on some biographies of the guys from the 11 Kansas. So go ahead and talk about those. Yeah, this was something that um, from the get-go I really wanted to do in this exhibit. I, I didn't want it to be like a lot of museum exhibits where they're stuff exhibits right. and you look at things. Um, the story of the 11th Kansas at its core is a story of people. They're more than just the things they carried. What were they like? How did they know each other? Personalities, that kind of thing. And so um, I was able to actually do a lot of research and come up with 22 biographical panels. So as you go through the exhibit, you can see a photograph and a short biography of members of the 11th Kansas. And so you can see some of them, um, like Private Bonwell, was killed out here. Some yeah. of them survived the war. And you can find out you know, what happened after their service, what were they doing right. before their service? Um, how did they know each other? Um, a lot of these men knew each other before the war. Uh, some of them ran businesses together after the war. Um, there's also photographs of them at GAR reunions <laughs> after the war. Right. So you can kind of get more of a, a feel of who they were as people as opposed to just this one little snapshot in time. Right, and I, I think it's unique too. You don't, you're, you're not really, especially when you pick a regiment, you're not really lucky enough to get photos of so many individuals from one regiment, especially ones that were here. And here, with your biographical panels, I mean, you have, I mean, it looks like, at least the ones you picked, photos of, of the actual guys along with their bios. And yeah, so that's, exactly. That's pretty rare. I know like when I do research, uh, even on the left Ohio or some of like the uh, first Minnesota guys, uh, you know, there may be a company that was really well photographed, but it never fails. Like the one I want to research and they never have any photos on them. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's great that uh, the, you said 22? 22 biograph biographical panels. And then there's some more um, just above the exhibit there that are just photographs that we didn't have enough to do a biography, but we still had their portrait and we wanted to you know show those but every every photograph that you see in here all those men they were all stationed here at Casper because not the entire regiment was stationed at Fort Casper but every man in the exhibit you see here was that's great all right on to the next one okay all right, so we're going to move from the biographical portraits to, uh, I see some saddlebags, some pommel holsters, and a stirrup here. So what's going on here? Um, these are actually pretty amazing. Uh, these are all on loan to us uh, from the Lyon County History Center in Emporia. Uh, these are actually Colonel Preston Plum's saddlebags, holsters, and one of his stirrups that came off his saddle. The oh. saddle's also on exhibit. Um, but what's especially neat about these is we actually know who made these saddlebags and when they made them. So okay. uh, Corporal George Saunders made these saddlebags for Colonel Plum in February of 1865 while they were at Fort Kearney. Okay. And he actually recorded that in his diary. And so that was a piece of information that we had gotten here at the museum from the family. Interesting. And then while I was doing research in Emporia and talking to the museum staff, and they said, oh, we have a saddle, we have a saddlebags. Really? And I'm thinking, way I know who made these, which they <laughs> the didn't have yeah, that information. Right. And so not only were we able to combine that information, but now being able to put those objects on display instead of it just being right. Colonel Plum's saddlebag, we can tell folks exactly when it was made, who made them, where they were when they were made, which is pretty, you know, it just adds another level oh, to yeah. the story. I mean, the detail, like I said, the detail of knowing that those saddlebags were made from, from Saunders on the way, you know, on the way out here. Uh, that's that's amazing. So, okay, so we go from the saddlebags that were made by Saunders for Preston Plum saddle, and now we have Preston Plum saddle. Now, how do we know this is actually Preston Plum saddle? Well, that's an easy one. It's got his name on it. <laughs> it actually has his name on it. Um, yeah, this right. is a, a presentation saddle, and what's really interesting about this is it actually says PB Plum Major. 11th Kansas Volunteers. So we actually know so we it's got his that. name on it. Yeah. And because of his rank of major, we know this is late 1862 through 1863 before his promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. And we know specifically 
it's his saddle, and this is the saddle that he used throughout the war. And so between those saddlebags and then this saddle, uh, we're relatively confident that this saddle came out here uh, during their last few months of enlistment. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So that's, yeah. That's amazing. So this, this saddle actually was out here. It was out here in service, and this is the first time it's been back here since 1865. Wow, that's amazing. All right, so we're moving from the saddle, which is amazing. It was here. I mean, there's, there's so, so much interesting stuff here. Then we're moving to an interesting letter that's on display here. So give us some detail on just, it's what, one, two-page letter? Yeah, it's a single-page letter. Um, it doesn't look like much. It's just a piece of paper, but it's probably, I would say, the most powerful thing we have on exhibit. Uh, this is a letter home from Private William Bonwell. Uh, to his mother where he's describing what life is like at Camp Dodge, he calls it their mountain home, describes you know spending time in the trees huh. and what it was like up there and he never finished his letter and on June 3rd of 1865 he was killed in a skirmish out here and so he never got a chance to finish that letter to his mother really? and uh, the officers of the regiment wrote a note on there uh, saying what happened and wow. sent the letter to his mother and uh, it, it really gives you a reminder of that, the humanity, you know, what oh, he's yeah, writing right. in the letter, but also the human cost of, wow. of that service. So you can actually see a letter from a veteran that he was killed before he was able to finish. Camp Dodge, uh, that, we've, the Camp Dodge has kind of been a, a mystery and, and not a mystery at the same time. Um, what, so we have Fort Casper here, Fort Laramie you know, is, is 150 miles east of here. Uh, what is Camp Dodge? Where was Camp Dodge? Uh, I mean, because it, it seems very close to Fort Casper here. Right, it's only about five, seven miles from here. Oh, really? uh, Camp Dodge was the regimental headquarters for the 11th Kansas Cavalry. Uh, when they arrived here in April of 65, they decided they did not want to garrison the men here and so they moved mm -hmm. up along Garden Creek um, on both sides of Garden Creek which is actually very interesting uh, most forts and Civil War camps are you know sort of a, a circle it's, yeah. it's a set together right. Camp Dodge was in a v-shape and so they were split by companies along the sides of Garden Creek and so that's where Bonwell was and he was writing his letter and huh. what's most amazing and that we owe Private Bonwell a huge debt of gratitude for is he had asked one of the soldiers of the regiment to draw a map of Camp Dodge and so until we received this as a donation at the Fort Casper Museum we didn't know exactly where Camp Dodge was or how it was set up and because the map that he had drawn is a really good map, um, it's very detailed, it includes triangles to represent tents, and it includes squares with triangles to represent buildings. Mm -hmm. So we know that they actually had three buildings at like Camp actual Dodge. Log actual buildings. log structures, yeah. Wow. And so that was all new information, and that was sent home to Bonwell's mother along with his letter and, and he didn't finish. Talking about le learning where this is, we only learned over the past, what, two years or yeah. year or two years ago Two years. where where Camp Dodge was because of, only because of this drawing. Yeah, I mean we had a lot of ideas. We knew based on description it was by, fre it was by fresh water, it was by timber, it was up in the hills mm -hmm. at the base of the mountain and it was five to seven miles and one of the men had timed it at a gallop and said it was about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these things were really vague, so we kind of had <laughs> an idea, but we couldn't, we couldn't actually go to a spot and say this is it, that yeah. was it. And then we got this map, and um, unfortunately, the map is only a photocopy. The original has been lost, um, but thank goodness for the photocopy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so we were able to recreate that uh, in the exhibit. You can see a drawing of what Camp Dodge actually looked like um, and what's really amazing about it is that Colonel Plum was under no orders to make that uh, that was his own personal choice uh, he got here to Fort Casper did not like the terrain <laughs> um, and wanted to put his men up there and yeah. having personally been up there it actually makes a lot of sense uh, there's visibility in all directions yeah. from there uh, so you can see any incoming threat long before it gets here you have the fresh water there's a fresh water spring right there there's timber close by good grazing for horses plenty of grass, up there, plenty of grass. I mean it's an ideal location and it allows you to see basically the entirety of the city of Casper 
Wow. That's All right, Joanna. So now moving on to this case here, uh, what do we have with the, uh, the photos here? And it looks like the, the ribbons. What's, what do we got here? Yeah, so this case, uh, we wanted to talk a lot about the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. So in other words, what happens to the soldiers after the war? Um, how do they stay in touch? You know, what are their lives like? And so we wanted to, to tell folks about the GAR, kind of express what it was, and then show some items from there. So this uh, black ribbon here that says PB Plum, this is actually a mourning ribbon from the GAR post in Emporia, Kansas. Uh, after Plum died in 1891, they renamed the uh, GAR post in Emporia the PB Plum post. And so when one of their members would pass away, they would wear a mourning ribbon. And so that's what this is here. And the red, white, and blue ribbon next to it there, this is a Women's Relief Corps ribbon. So think of it as like a women's auxiliary to the GAR. And that one actually belonged to Carrie Plum. So that belonged to Preston Plum's wife, Carrie. We also have a discharge certificate for Samuel Rainey, the 11th Kansas. Uh, we have a portrait of Henry Towner of the 11th Kansas, and you can see he's wearing uh, a GAR membership ribbon there yeah. in his portrait. Um, we have a signature of Colonel Moonlight of the 11th Kansas, who then became governor of Wyoming. Um, and then we have a flask that belonged to George Bridges of the 11th Kansas, but this is post-war, so this is something he would have had after his service. So this, all of this case is kind of post-war, mm -hmm but all connected to the 11th Kansas. And that's why we have the pictures above too, the GAR reunions with some of the men in there. Yeah, especially like the picture of Bates Schrader. and Schrader, because there's Bates younger right next to it, and then Schrader's pictures over there. All right, so now we're at one of my favorite areas, which is the, uh, the photographic uh, display that we have here. Uh, and, and some of the details we have here in the photographs are, are amazing. Uh, some guys you've already talked about. So what do we have in this case here? Uh, yeah, so this is our sort of assortment of original photographs of members of the 11th Kansas. So we have a lot of photographs on exhibit, but they're scans. They're not ones that we physically have the pictures. Right. And these are ones that we do. Um, so we've got one of... Uh, Colonel Plum, but this is when he's a captain. So he's really young in that one. He's very young, um, and he's holding his, uh, you know, the infantry hat, and, and you can see he doesn't have the rest of his yeah. uniform. Right. Um, so this was taken in Leavenworth uh, right when he enlisted, so this would have been August, September of 62, okay. um, which is pretty cool. Um, this is a tintype of James Schrader. Uh, Schrader uh, was one of the few survivors of the Battle of Red Buttes. And we actually have his canteen on exhibit as well. So it's neat to see that portrait of him. And we have uh, him younger in life. And then later on, we have a photo of him, uh, him and Bates, actually. Yeah. Uh, older, at a, older in life, right? Yeah, yeah. at a GAR reunion. Um, showing, you know, that he kept in touch with, yeah. with all of his, his fellow soldiers. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of, of <laughs> Private Henry Godlove. Me um, too. I, I, I you love just love. Photo. And he's got all of his weapons decked out, yeah. um, you yeah. know. Especially from a, from a cavalry perspective, you know, from the 11th OVC, uh, our, our unit, um, like it's just photo or setting photos like that to have the weapon, the canteen, the, the, the accoutrements and, and everything and his headgear, like everything, like that picture, I absolutely love. <laughs> uh, there's so much there to study for sure, so. Yeah, it's a great one. And, and it's kind of another example, you know, as you go through and look at the photographs here, you'll see some of them are in a, full uniform as they should be. Right. Some of them might have a cavalry hat and an infantry jacket, or right. they might you know, be kind of mixed up a little. Well, and that's and, because the 11th was originally infantry, right? Right, and that's why Plum's holding you know, infantry uh, there, it, because they were originally an infantry unit, and then they were converted to cavalry in 63. So that process in itself was kind of a mess. <laughs> right. um, so some of the companies got horses before they got uniforms and weapons. Right. Some of them got weapons and no, you know, right. horses. I mean, yeah. it was just kind of a mess for a while, but you know, you can definitely see that progression. So when you look at their uniforms, if they're in an infantry uniform, you can date that right. as well. This has to be 62 or 63. Yeah. Um, this other tintype, uh, this is Private Bonwell, uh, who we talked about with the letter home that he never got to finish. Uh, Private Bonwell was actually killed out here um, and was buried at Camp Dodge. 
And um, just kind of a fun story with him and Casper, um, he actually has a very strong connection to the city of Casper. So he was killed out here and he was buried at Camp Dodge, which was at the base of Casper Mountain. And for Memorial Day, uh, prior to when his grave was moved in 1899, the residents of Casper would go and leave flowers on his grave. Really? So every Memorial Day, Casperites would come and honor Private Bonwell. So he's got a, a strong connection to our Casper history. So, and, and there's some other photos uh, of another, you know, clearly cavalry trooper. Looks like his clothes doesn't fit him and his boots are too big. But, yeah, uh, Eugene Bush, this is a great <laughs> photograph. And especially, photo. he looks like he's about 12. Right. Um, but you can just see, yeah, it's another one kind of like God loves, you know, where you look at, you're looking at the sword, the, you know, the uni oh, yeah. all the details and everything. Yeah, and David Johnson, he was a hospital steward, um, so that's a neat picture of him. And then uh, Frederick Richard, Company I, also out here, um, another great photograph. All right, so uh, what do we have here as far as this book? So this is a pretty neat item. Um, this is actually on loan for me. Um, this is a original program for the 1890 play called The Senator. And the play was a fictional play. Uh, the plot was fictional, but the character, Senator Rivers, was modeled on Preston Plum and his career as a senator. And it ran for 119 performances on Broadway. Um, it toured the country. It was a very, very popular play. Um, and it was even made into a silent film in 1915, which has unfortunately since been lost. And the Fort Casper Museum Association partnered with Stage 3 and Theater of the Poor to actually put on a production of The Senator in uh, September of 2023, which you can find on YouTube. So if you want to yes. watch The Senator, uh, you can visit the Fort Casper Museum Association YouTube channel and check it out. All right, so this is a, a very prominent painting. Uh, what, what's this? Uh, so this is actually a portrait of Colonel Preston Plum. And this was done sometime while he was a U.S. Senator from Kansas. Um, I don't know who the painter was. Uh, this is on loan to us from the Lyon County History Center in Emporia. And what makes this painting pretty amazing is I found it uh, in what was originally his house. Preston Plum died in 1891. And his wife continued to live in his home in Emporia, Kansas, and remodeled it and made it into this huge mansion that it is today. When she died in 1919, the house became a women's shelter. And this portrait hung in that house for years and decades and unfortunately started to mold. And about the end of 2020, the women's shelter ceased operations, and so the house was put up for sale, and they were going to actually do a liquidation sale of everything in the home. And so I made a beeline down to Emporia in February of, would have been 2021? And in the snowstorm, yeah. everything. Um, and went through the house trying to identify what items I could that belonged to the Plum family that were still there. And this was one of the things I found. And this painting was covered in black mold and white mold, uh, so much so that the whole background of it was completely discolored. It had a blue background. Um, it was just, the paint was cracking. It was in terrible shape. And um, I identified it set it aside, and it kind of sat in limbo because no one had decided what was going to happen to the house yet. It was uh, in receivership with the bank there. And so I brought this to the attention of the Fort Casper Museum Association board and asked if we could fund the conservation <clears throat> and restoration of the painting, uh, which the board agreed to. And so we hired a conservator in Kansas City who restored the painting, and because of that, we were able to borrow this painting for this exhibit and have it on display. All right, so right next to the painting, what else do we have? It looks like some photos and some shoulder boards here. Yeah, this is all sort of our Preston Plum case, so everything relates to him. Uh, this top photograph is a tintype with, of him with an unidentified man. Uh, Plum is actually on the left. This was taken likely around 1856 uh, based on the clothes he's wearing. I've been able to identify that with another photograph. So I can date it. I know it was taken in Ohio. I don't know who the second man is in the photograph. But it was likely done when he started his first newspaper in Xenia, Ohio. And the second picture down is uh, from him, uh, from his service when he was a major. It was taken at Fort Smith in 1864. And 
right next to that are his major shoulder boards. So the same shoulder boards that are in that photograph are right there next to it. And uh, this last item, this is actually a book of memorial addresses from the Senate. So when Plum died in 1891, he was an active U.S. Senator. And so members of the Senate and the House of Representatives basically gave eulogies for him for a number of days. And they were all typed up and bound together in these books. And what makes this book especially special is that it's the leather-bound version, which the leather-bound copies were only given to members of Plum's immediate family. So this belonged to one of his children, brother, sister, immediate family members. All right, so now, Joanna, we are here uh, at a horizontal uh, display with a guide on and some arrows. Can you tell us about uh, what these are all about? Yeah, this, this case is pretty amazing. Um, like we mentioned earlier, for a lot of things in this exhibit, they have not been here since 1865, right. and that's especially true with this. Uh, we have one of their original silk guidons, uh, which is on loan to us from the State Museum in Topeka. It's in great condition for a silk guidon. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, 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 you can tell it's seen better days. It's starting to kind of disintegrate <laughs> right. a little bit, but yeah. um, this would have been out here in 1865. Mm -hmm. And so being able to put this on exhibit for folks to see again is, is just amazing. It is, now, this, is this is something else. I mean, you know, like I said, Flags in general are, are a whole different paradigm or a whole different world when it comes to you know research and uh, pr preservation. You know, it's a, it's it's a yeah. whole it's a whole ordeal to preserve these things and have uh, them allow us to then display it for this um, for this exhibit is, is amazing. Yeah, we're we're incredibly grateful to them for for loaning it to us, um, given especially how fragile. Yeah how fragile these silk flags are. And you can see, I mean, the, the painted, the hand-painted stars, I mean, it's, it's definitely, uh, definitely an original for sure. Yeah, and it's definitely something that you can see pictures of it online or in books, but right. there's no substitute for being able to go up and actually see, you yeah, know, the exactly. hand stitching and, like you say, the hand-painted stars on it. It's, it's pretty amazing. And then also, you know, to really kind of sit and think about all the battles and places yeah. that flag has been. Yeah. You know, no there's kidding. a lot of history there. No kidding. And off to the right here, it looks like we have some arrows and a canteen. What is the story behind these? Uh, so both of these are incredibly significant uh, for Casper history. Uh, these arrows are actual arrows from the Battle of Platte Bridge wow. that happened July 26, 1865. Um, these arrows were removed from Henry Grimm who was really? shot in the back and the leg with them. Uh, Henry Grimm is of the 11th Kansas. He survived his wounds wow. and uh, took the arrows home with him, sort of like a souvenir. <laughs> um, and they stayed in the family and then these eventually got donated to the Kansas Historical Society as well. And uh, we were fortunate to borrow these for this exhibit. And these are especially unique to have here because typically uh, you have to go to Topeka to see these. These yeah. are on exhibit at the State Museum. Really? Okay. And so because they're going through a remodel down there in Topeka, they came off exhibit, we were able to put them on display here, wow. and now they'll go back to Topeka where they'll go back That's amazing. on so exhibit the, there. These arrows were, arrows were actually pulled out uh, of, of someone at the Battle of Platte Bridge. Yes, That's amazing. from Henry Grimm who survived it. And we've got a great um, firsthand account of actually removing the arrows from him um, and, and what that process was like. It was not pretty, um, but we put that with the arrows so that people could read, right. read about that. But this is incredibly significant um, for Battle of Platte Bridge history, oh, Casper yeah. history. Um, and again, these have not been here since 1865. Wow. And the canteen, uh, that's actually from uh, Corporal Schrader and he was one of the survivors of the Battle of Red Buttes. Mm -hmm. And so that's his canteen. Um, so again, the same day, July 26, 1865, that canteen was at the Battle of Red Buttes. Wow. So, two, you know, two amazing artifacts there yeah, from, the from, yeah. from both of those battles, yeah. Is that canteen, I guess, did he, was that Schrader, I guess, made it back to the fort with that canteen, I guess. Yeah. Who, who, is that on loan from Topeka or where is that? That's from? actually on loan from a private collector. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, so that's we're... An actual, you know, Schrader's actual canteen. His actual canteen, yeah. 
and you know the story of, of his escape, you know, crawling through the sagebrush and yeah. he's to get out of you know the Battle of Red Buttes and survive and back to the fort is amazing in, in itself. Uh, kind of a plug to the uh, book called Portraits of the Upper Platte. Schrader's uh, yes, account of him getting away from the Indians is in that book. And uh, those of you who, who haven't read it, it's a really good book. Uh, go on Amazon, or uh, I guess it's available on Amazon, I think. Yeah, or and it's here, it's here. It's here at, at the, the Casper or the Fort Casper bookshop. Museum. Yeah. Um, but uh, he has a, just an amazing account of how he got away. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, like I said at the beginning, you know, obviously we want to have neat artifacts, but we didn't want it to be a stuff exhibit. So yes. we wanted to put the stories with it rather than just these are Native American arrows from a battle. <laughs> right. These are. Native American made arrows that were pulled out of Henry Grimm. This yeah. is a canteen that was dragged along the sagebrush and the sand. All right, getting away from... Yeah, yeah, exactly, from the Battle of Red Butte. So it's more than just the things, it's the stories that go with them. And, and we have just some fantastic stories with these items. Oh, this is amazing, absolutely amazing. All right, so here in this case, we have a, a kind of a plethora uh, of weapons that were issued to the 11th Kansas, you know, throughout their service, both Eastern, well, the Western Theater of the Civil War, and then Trans Mississippi out, out west, uh, out here at Fort Casper or Flatbridge Station. But more specifically, what's with the, uh, the buck and ball and the, uh, the piece of artillery that we have here? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the 11th Kansas, when they were first formed, they were issued buck and ball muskets. And these were antiquated Prussian muskets, uh, sometimes called Potsdam muskets, um, basically dating back to the War of 1812. Yeah. These, were, these were antiques in the <laughs> Civil War. Um, and we've got one of the muskets on exhibit. We also have examples of what the ammunition looked like. So the reason it's called buck and ball is it fires a musket ball and then three rounds of buckshot. Yeah. Um, and so these were particularly devastating on the battlefield. They're also much heavier and more awkward and yeah. unwieldy to carry than the newer muskets of the time. The men used to joke that when they were issued these, that they should have been classified as a light artillery regiment <laughs> instead of infantry. Um, they'd also joke that when they were doing target practice, other soldiers would move to the next county over because these things were just so devastating. Right, and, and it made, I mean, just the fact that they, they handled these weapons and they were issued these weapons, it kind of made an impact in the psyche of the regiment because they actually had a, uh, an opportunity to have their own, like, quote, newspaper, and what they call it? The buck and ball. Of course they did, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, what's the story with the buck and ball uh, printing, then? So, uh, the buck and ball newspaper uh, came about in December of 1862, so actually just prior to the Battle of Prairie Grove. Now the Battle of Prairie Grove was December 7th. Yeah. And they had come across a ramshackle, half destroyed printing press in Cane Hill, Arkansas. And Colonel Plum, uh, Edmund Ross, who was another senator from Kansas, um, a lot of other newspaper men got together and started putting it back together hmm. to print a newspaper. And so they printed half the newspaper as a single sheet, front and back, on December 6th. And then the Battle of Prairie Grove happened. So everyone scattered. Plum grabbed whatever newspapers they'd printed, threw them in the back of an ambulance, and they went off to fight the Battle of Prairie Grove. Well, after the battle, they came back. The newspaper press was destroyed again. Yeah. They put it back together again. Then they printed the second half, which was a, a perfect account of the Battle of Prairie Grove. Wow. And so when you look at the newspaper, it's actually dated December 6th but has the story of the battle that happened on the 7th, and that's why there's a discrepancy in the date. Huh. But they called the newspaper the Buck and Ball because that was very symbolic of them <laughs> and their regiment and the 11th Kansas, and uh, the newspaper made it all the way up to General Schofield. He wow. did not like the idea of them having their own newspaper, something about, you know, might fall into enemy hands or right. something. <laughs> and uh, so he put it into the newspaper. So there was only ever one issue oh, of the buck and ball. One um, issue. But it's, it's a fantastic account of <laughs> everything they had been doing prior to the Battle of Prairie Grove and then a great account of the Battle of Prairie Grove. Wow. All right, so we went through the exhibit. There's a lot here, uh, absolutely amazing. This has been on exhibit for, for how long now? Because we're getting toward the, the end of this. Uh, we are. But uh, So how long has this been on exhibit? So this has been up since March of 2023. Okay. So. And, and its last day is February 24th, 2024. So, you, so it's been up for, it'll be up for about a year. Almost a year, yeah. Yeah. And so it's got, you know, 
two, three, four more weeks left in yeah. before it gets taken down. So again, this is I mean, absolutely amazing. And like you said, you know, the, the, what the artifacts that have been here or that are here haven't been here. A lot of them haven't been here ever or since 1865 when the Kansas was here. Uh, the story yeah. of Eleventh Kansas, absolutely amazing. Uh, I mean, like, that, that's the thing. And, and when you, as a historian or like myself, like a hobby historian, you just the deeper you dive, you can't help but stumble upon amazing story after amazing story after amazing story. And really, even in your own life, doing this, it seems like that's kind of the same thing as you stumble on artifact after discovery after discovery. Uh, and then with all of those combined, you were able, uh, with the help of a lot of other people, to, to bring this together. So much so that you were able to actually have one of the rare uh, family ancestor reunions of the yeah. 11th, uh, sorry, 11th Kansas here uh, this past summer. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that was absolutely amazing. Um, and it's through basically the power of social media. <laughs> um, uh, and we had some contacts with families that had been through to the museum before, so we were able to send emails. But yeah, this past July, uh, we organized a reunion of descendants of the 11th Kansas. and. I imagine that's not something that happens often no, um, <laughs> these days. Yeah, yeah, name any regiment. I guarantee it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, we had um, we had about twenty different soldiers represented. Wow! In this reunion, um, so we had um, Henry Godlove's family came, uh, Corporal Schrader's family came, uh, so they were able to see the canteen. Uh, George Saunders' family came and were able to look at the saddlebags that they're ancestor made. Um, we had Henry Grimm's family out, so they were able to see the arrows. Um, and it, it was just amazing. Um, they came from, some came from here in Wyoming, uh, some came from Colorado, uh, some came from Arizona, Illinois, wow. Kansas, uh, Missouri, all over. And uh, we had them out here. We had a nice kind of welcome barbecue, which was great. Um, we took them through the exhibit and we took them out to Camp Dodge and took them out to some historic sites around. And really what, what came out of this that was so amazing is, you know, all of these folks, they had never met each other. Right. They, they, I mean, they were essentially strangers. Yeah. Um, and by the end of it, uh, we have, we've all exchanged email addresses. We have kind of a group email going now. We have a Google Drive where they're putting photographs in and wow. documents sharing these histories. Some of them brought things for show and tell. Um, and it, it really just reminded me of those old GAR reunions, yeah. you know, right. and, and seeing the photographs of the soldiers getting together, having reunions, and here we're, you know, four, five, six generations down, but they're still being brought together because of because these of stories, this, yeah. and it's bringing these families together. And, you know, we just had um, some descendants visit the exhibit yesterday. Yeah. Um, right. So they're still coming, and uh, it, it was just amazing to be able to show them these stories, artifacts that related to their family, and then allow them to meet fellow descendants. Yeah. That, that was, to me, that's probably one of my proudest things to be able to do is to bring these oh, great. people together. The, the stories, I mean, even the, uh, the interviews and some of the, the things they've said is just, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity for sure. Yeah. So I gotta ask, before we end it, out of everything here, what's your favorite single article or artifact uh, on display? Here? You're gonna ask me to pick one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, obviously, I'm biased to anything plum. Yeah, because well, um, you've been you know, studying him as a person just for, for like a decade. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then my book and everything. Yeah. So on that sense, probably for me personally, it's the painting. Um, because that was something that I can look back on it and say I made a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah. I found that in the house, covered in mold, was able to, you know, bring Save that to it. our yeah. board here and get it saved. And so that's something that you know, after I'm long gone, that painting will still be safe in a museum, right. you know, for other people to see. So that's probably one of my favorite things. And, you know, <sighs> picking one is tough because there's just so <laughs> many, right. so many significant well, I, things I, I, I see. I, I wouldn't be able to answer because, I mean, it, just within the photos, I mean, forget the, the artifacts, the photos alone, I couldn't uh, pick my favorite because you have, I mean, with being, you know, having research of ton of photos myself. Uh, you have a photo here of a guy wearing two earrings. Yeah. Uh, which is 
unbelievably rare, right? Uh, you have a photo, you have, you have a couple photos of guys with all their accoutrements, uh, whether it's a tin type or a CDV, uh, there's just a photo of all of them uniformed out or kitted out. Uh, and of course, as, as a living historian, you know, I, I geek out and nerd out on that as well. So just, there's so, I can't even make a decision on photos. Well, and then like, articles, you like know. Uh, Hank Hammer's photo, you can see, and he's got the torn sleeve right. and everything, you know, so you can see like, okay, something happened yeah. to him and his uniform. Yeah, um, there's a story there. <laughs> there's yeah. a story there in that picture, yeah. oh, no, which to me, you know, when I look at the portraits of the guys, I think those are probably kind of my favorite, the ones that, mm -hmm. obviously they're all posed, but something that's a little bit different right. that kind of stands out like well why is he wearing that or yeah. why is he doing that because you know there's a story behind it yeah no, i mean I, if i had to pick an art, artifact i would say my favorite is probably the, the arrows uh, because you know doing tours here with you know third and fourth graders and i tell a story of you know the Paddle Platte Bridge and Red Buttes and how, you know, a lot of guys who came back over the bridge were wounded or had wounds of, of some sort. Uh, there was uh, accounts of guys, at least uh, reading from the ORs, which ironically, the ORs, the official records of the War of the Rebellion, you would not expect to have uh, battlefield reports from you know, trans-Mississippi battles, and, but there are. I ran across uh, some reports and, you know, they, they mentioned you know, arrows sticking out of the guys' backs when they were getting across the bridge. And being able to tell that story and say, oh, by the way, there's one of the arrows that I'm talking about. Like that arrow yeah. was, was sticking out of one of the soldiers and they took it out and he kept it as a souvenir. I mean, yeah, and that's there's, amazing. You know, and, and that's a great point, you know, being able to do exhibits like these, you can take things that now when you look back on it historically, it's kind of abstract. It's right. the Battle of Platte Bridge right. and there are stories and... You know, it, it, it's, it's not tangible. Right. But when you see the arrows from the battle, now it's tangible. Yeah. Now when you say he had an arrow pulled out of his back and you can see what those arrows look like with the metal arrowheads, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it's, oh, that arrow. Yeah. You know, it, it, it really makes it um, more real, yeah. I think, you know. Um, there was another story of one of, the, one of the guys that survived and they took the arrow out of his back where it, it was, stuck yeah so somebody held on to the arrow from his back and then he ran <laughs> in the opposite direction and they you know yeah, yanked it out <laughs> and and you know you hear that story and you think oh my god that's awful yeah. and then when you look at the arrow and you think that was that's it. what they were yanking, yanking out. out of him you think oh my god i mean you know it really it brings these stories home. Well, Joanna, I, I'm sure this is a long enough video, so we'll go ahead and end it there. I know you and I could talk forever on this yep, stuff. Yep, yep, I wrote but, a book on it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, let's go ahead, since we're here, let's go ahead and plug your book. Book plug, book okay. Book plug, uh, so it, what's the book again? Uh, we had a, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and tag the, the uh, live stream that we had on it, but go ahead and just quick plug on the book. What's the title and where can I get it? Uh, the book is called The Forgotten Senator, The Life and Character of Preston B. Plum. And it's stories of his life as told by those who knew him. Yeah. Uh, it's available here locally in Casper at the Fort Casper Museum and at Wind City Books. Uh, you can buy it online at PrestonPlum.com, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, it's available in different stores in Kansas as well, so Emporia, Lawrence. Yeah. Council Grove, Salina, um, different so places there have it. If you want to know if you're from the Wyoming area and you want to know about Central Wyoming history, buy it. If you're from Kansas, he was a senator and uh, just an amazing individual uh, over yeah. there in Kansas. Uh, go ahead and grab that uh, that book. So, without that or without further ado, I guess we'll go ahead and end it there. Join up. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right.